There's this popular programming paradigm that has become quite popular in graphical user interfaces. It's called asynchronous programming. If you want to think it this way, it's basically a shortcut to multi-threading because the API already provides support for um, handling the basics of starting threads or closing the threads and not leaving certain things open. It is done via a pool of threads that allows us to manage things really easily. But let me explain uh, why it is popular with graphical user interfaces. Let's assume that we have this really cool app that we see here. And right now, even though that the app is displaying two images, it loaded a bunch of other images in the background. Those images in the background, by the time that we start scrolling and we get to that image uh, highlighted by the red arrow, then the application is going to call the server in an asynchronous way without blocking the main thread, getting a, a callback for more images, and then it loads them and adds them to the queue. So basically, when you add them to the queue, uh, you see a continuous scrolling without the, the uh, GUI just being frozen. Once you get the images back and you add them to the queue, it doesn't freeze the GUI because it was done in a background thread. So then, how do you do uh, asynchronous programming? It's very simple. Let's, uh, it's via uh, what it's called a completable future. And a completable future is a, a completable future is a Java API that allows us to uh, start and it calls a function via the functional and interfaces, and it allows us to uh, perform certain tasks in background. So, for example, let's consider that our main thread is the one that is uh, updating the GUI and it's the one that is gonna draw things. So it's the one that it's also going to receive the button when you press a button on your application or uh, when you click something or when you start typing. And um, when those actions are received, then it sends a command to the asynchronous fork uh, join pool. Um, and then it starts performing task after task after task until it's done and then it essentially clears that task from that from that queue. Uh, in other words, if we were going to look at this as an example of um, the code, we would see that the step one is where we decided to, in this particular example, we do have the uh, completable future just generated and then we, we pass the arguments as functional interfaces or as references to functions to the series of steps of how it's going to be executed. So uh, we see that we're passing step one, and then once it's done, then it will start step two, and then step three. Um, and as it's done with those tasks, it just does them sequentially, one after the other, but the main thread is not interrupted. Let's just look at the live. So in this IntelliJ code, we're gonna see the same, the same sample, but we're gonna play a little bit further. So we have our entry point where we're starting our asynchronous sample class with a completable future, then we say that we're gonna call step one, step two, and step three in that order. So once step one is completed, then it's gonna pass the return state as an entry point to step two. That's why step two has to have the same data type that step one received, and then pass the output of that is passed to step three. So it becomes this chain of commands. In this case, I decided that I wanted the thread to sleep, um, mostly because I want just to prove that the steps are, are done in a sequential manner um, and they're not blocking the main thread. So if anything, I am going to do um, while, let's do int count equals zero, while, and let's do a four, four, int count equals zero, let's just put it here, and then count less than three, than five times, then count plus plus. And then here, we're gonna slip for one second, and we're gonna system.out.println sleeping plus count. So now we have a sleep with uh, with what is the second that we've been sleeping and we're um, sleeping one second so that way we can see how this thing is done. And in each one of these, I'm also going to sleep the steps. So I'm, this function process basically is just a function that is gonna print the current name of the function. Um, and 
here on this thread, actually, right after that process, I'm just gonna do it in one. Right after that print, I'm going to, um, so basically I am just modifying this thing, this thread, so I am going to print my the method name that I am my output and then sleep for one second and then continue to step two and then continue to step three. So basically we're gonna start seeing an overlap of the main thread with all the other asynchronous tasks happening. Essentially, we're going to see how immediately it's jumping into our sleeping count. We're going to see sleep zero, then it's going to sleep for one second, then we're going to see sleep one done. Then we're going to see sleep two, and then step two, and then sleep three, and step three. So it's very much uh, interweaved. So let's run it and see how it goes. Sleep zero, sleep one. You can see how basically our sleeping one and our step one started happening like pretty much like a gear where one process is sleeping on the uh, on the other because the completable future essentially helped us to do this uh, in an asynchronous way so um i guess in it, the the last thing to like really highlight on on this thing is what can we use or what is a cheat sheet for the completable futures for us to pass the really good arguments and to understand better our functional interfaces. So this little table here, any function, if we if we go into the into the API, and if I open up a window and bring a Java Java completable future API, we're gonna see that functions that have the word run, it's going to run a sync is gonna receive a runnable. That means a thread uh, class. We can actually use a thread class for this and it's gonna execute it. Um, if we use a supply, you know, you can see the prefix supply and the supply here, it's gonna expect a supplier. And the function for a signature or so if a supplier is gonna, it's gonna uh, return, it's gonna have empty arguments, but it's gonna return a value. Then if we look for apply a sync, we're gonna see that it receives a function, uh, as a functional interface. And a function is basically a function who receives an object and returns another object. Then uh, if we do accept, it's gonna be a consumer. So a consumer, I, it looks, like this, where it's a function, it receives an argument, but it returns nothing. As far as how to describe those as lambdas, because we can also provide those as lambdas or as functional interfaces, this is a cheat sheet to go by. I honestly think that this is a, a, a really a good way of memorizing, or at the very least a handy thing of remembering that if we wanna call run async, we have to use an, a runnable. If we wanna do accept async, we have to use a consumer. Uh, apply a sync, it would be a function, supply a sync, it would be a supplier. So basically, depending on the shape of the function that you need to call in an asynchronous way, you would have to use the proper functional interface that matches that. I hope this was actually really useful for having a quick understanding of uh, asynchronous and a better understanding of uh, functional interfaces. Thank you.